Welcome to the Murder in 20 podcast, where I, Bobby Stevens, am your host with a new episode every Wednesday. If you're a serious fan of true crime and love listening to podcasts, but don't want all that small talk, you've come to the right place. We get right to the facts. Murder in 20 episodes are concise and complete in 20 minutes. Less talk and more true crime. Every episode is free on our website at murderin20.com, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, and YouTube. Also learn about upcoming episodes on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. To support Murder in 20, feel free to leave a five-star review on any one of them, or all of them. We're not shy. And we couldn't do this podcast without all our sources, which we acknowledge throughout the podcast and are listed on our website. Thanks for tuning in. Now let's get to this week's episode. Robert Spangler, known as Bob, was raised in Iowa. Born in 1933, he was adopted. His father was a university professor and civil engineer, and the geotechnical lab at the Iowa State University is named after him. The New York Daily News reported that as a teenager, he was bright, brash, and full of confidence. He also had a wicked temper. Nancy was his high school sweetheart, and in 1955, after college, the couple got married. He joined the Army, and after his discharge, worked in broadcasting, where he contributed to the TV show Sesame Street. Their son, David, was born in 1961 and their daughter in 1963. In the early 1970s, they moved from Iowa to Littleton, Colorado. But by 1977, Bob was no longer happy with married life and his family. He was working at American Waterworks Association as the head of public relations when he fell for a co-worker named Sharon. It became common knowledge that they were having an affair and Bob moved out of the family home for a time. But in the fall of 1978, he broke it off with Sharon and moved back home. Court records would later indicate that Sharon didn't like his, and Bob, well, apparently, he was done with them too. Bob's family had just enjoyed Christmas. They had no idea what he had been secretly planning. Days before, he asked Nancy to sign a blank piece of paper under the premise that it was for a Christmas letter. She signed with the initial N. Then he used it to type a suicide note. December 30th was a Saturday. That morning, he told Nancy he had a surprise for her in the basement. He waited patiently as she went downstairs. He asked her to sit in a chair and told her to close her eyes. And when she did, he shot her at close range in the forehead with a Smith & Wesson 38 caliber revolver. Bob then went upstairs and opened the door to Susan's bedroom. She was asleep in bed. He crept up close and shot her in the back. Then he walked to David's room. But this time, stood back six to eight feet and fired once, hitting David in the chest. But he didn't die immediately. Bob overpowered his son and pressed his face into the pillow until he stopped breathing. He returned to the basement and laid the suicide note and the gun near Nancy's body. Nancy was 45, David 17, and Susan, 15. A neighbor friend of Susan's was calling the Spangler house and getting no answer, so he snuck into the home. He discovered Susan dead, still lying on her bed. Then he went to David's room and saw his face on the pillow and his body partially hanging off the bed. When police arrived, they found Nancy slumped over in the chair the gun and the suicide note that read, I feel shattered. We have always argued about who'd have the kids. I will. I know you'll get along. You always have. The Daily Sentinel reported that Bob told investigators that Nancy had ordered him out of the house that morning. 
and that he had walked around shopping, then returned home to pick up his car, but did not go into the house. He then drove around and went to a movie. On New Year's Day, the Arapahoe County Sheriff's Office announced that they had no suspects in the family's deaths. Police were suspicious and tested Bob's hands for gun residue. The test came back positive. Bob changed his original story and explained that instead he had gone for a walk that morning and when he returned he found Nancy slumped over in the chair with blood dripping from her head. He saw the gun and picked it up, stepped back a few steps and dropped it. He still claimed that he'd gone to the movie but left early because he was worried that he hadn't called anyone about his wife. Hmm, this part makes no sense. Most people would have called the police, not gone to a movie. Although police had found evidence suggesting that it wasn't a suicide, without a confession, they didn't have enough evidence to charge him. The coroner ruled that it was a double homicide and a suicide. And Nancy's family? They were suspicious too. After their murders, Bob never visited Nancy's family, which seemed odd to them. Sharon and Bob reunited, and seven months after his family's murder, they got married and she moved into the Spangler home. She and Bob shared an interest in hiking, particularly the Grand Canyon. Sharon even published a book called On Foot in the Grand Canyon, Hiking the Trails of the South Rim. Six million people visit the Grand Canyon every year. It's 227 miles long, spans 18 miles wide, and drops down a mile. It's raw nature at its best. Its rock walls carved out some six million years ago with hidden caves among its towering red walls of limestone. It's home to poisonous snakes, bears, elk, and mountain lions. One of its most dangerous animals is a rock squirrel, which looks innocent enough, but has a nasty bite. Donna Sunling had gotten divorced in the mid-1970s. She had five grown children and five grandchildren. She lived in Littleton and was an aerobics instructor. She met Bob through a singles ad on April 11, 1989. They married exactly a year later, then moved to Durango. There Bob became a popular music DJ for a radio station and coached kids in soccer and basketball. But a year into their marriage, their differences and lack of similar interests put a strain on the relationship but not enough for them to separate or divorce. That is, until the spring of 1993, when a plan began to formulate in Bob's brain. He started thinking of ways to get out of his marriage. Donna and Bob's three-year wedding anniversary was coming up, and Bob talked Donna into going on a vacation to celebrate, a camping and hiking trip to the Grand Canyon. She was hesitant. Although she was athletic, she was afraid of heights and got vertigo and used walking poles to hike. The Williams Grand Canyon News reported that they arrived at the canyon April 9th. The Grand View Trail was their first hike that offered a leg muscle workout and spectacular views while descending down into the canyon, 2,600 feet below the rim, into the Horseshoe Mesa, once there, they hiked east down the Page Spring Trail to Hans Creek. The trail is steep, difficult, and exposed. Covered in loose gravel and rocks, they would have been watching every step. Once at the creek, they camped for the night. The next day, they hiked around the area and went back up a rugged section of the trail to the Last Chance Mine, where they huddled down for their second night. The next morning was Easter Sunday. It was also their third wedding anniversary. They set out hiking, and near the mine, there was a bend in the trail. The sun was rising and provided a spectacular view of the canyon. 
At this particular spot in the trail, Bob knew this was his only chance. Standing face to face with Donna, he made a spur-of-the-moment decision. He pushed her. They struggled, but her small frame was no match for him. Donna fell 160 feet, straight down and landed on the hard earth below. She sustained massive injuries, multiple cuts and fractures to her chest, neck, and lower body. Bob had done it again. It had been 15 years since he murdered his first wife and children. Now, he had murdered wife number three. Bob hiked down to her crumpled body, up against a tree and under a steep cliff not far from the trail. He covered her with a red bandana and a blue tarp. He then hiked out of the canyon and to the National Park Service backcountry office at the South Rim. When he arrived, he quietly stood in line. At 11.24 a.m., when it was his turn, he told the ranger that his wife had fallen to her death. He explained that she had been posing for a photo and that when he turned his back to set up the tripod for the camera, she must have fallen. When he turned back around, she was gone. He claimed that he'd scrambled down to her and discovered she was dead. He then washed her face and covered her with a tarp. Rangers hiked down to Donna's body. Along the way, they noticed her items strewn about from where she had gone over the ledge down to where she had landed. It would take them two days to extract her body. Donna was dead at 59. Bob was 60 and still alive. That year was a treacherous one for deaths in the canyon. It had taken six lives. And not all deaths are due to tragic accidents. Murders are common. In 2006, a body was discovered below a waterfall. The woman had been stabbed 29 times. Then there are the suicides. A woman who watched the movie Thelma and Louise over 50 times drove her car off the rim of the canyon. But she was lucky. The car suspension got caught on a rock, but she wasn't about to let that change her mind. She jumped off the cliff, only to fall onto a large boulder 20 feet below. Still, she wasn't about to be deterred. Although bruised and bloody, she crawled to the edge and rolled off to her death. Prior to this in 2004, passengers on a helicopter had a scenic tour they will never forget. Mid-flight over the deepest part of the canyon, and without warning, a man who appeared quiet and calm opened the door and jumped out and fell 4,000 feet to his death. Donna's friends found her death unusual and suspected Bob had something to do with it and wondered if he had given his wife a Grand Canyon to force, as it was called. And her family found it suspicious too especially when he had her cremated before her mother had even arrived. However, investigators could find nothing to indicate Bob had murdered Donna. The Daily Sentinel reported that eight months after her death, Bob told a radio reporter that he had hiked about 800 miles in the canyon and that those things happen in canyon country. The canyon didn't take her life. God didn't take her life. It just happened. When you are in a place that has precipitous terrain, the possibility is always there, and that he surmised that she just adjusted her pack or lost her balance, or she stepped on a rock that rolled under her feet. And Dennis Hill, who worked with Bob when his family was shot, said that when he heard Donna had died, he knew Bob had pushed her. Now, what Bob didn't know is that when the Arapahoe County officials heard about Donna's death, they reopened the case into the 1978 death of his first wife and two children. Although divorced, Sharon and Bob kept in touch, 
and when she was down on her luck, she rented a room in his Durango home. On October 2, 1994, Sharon died from a drug overdose. There was nothing suspicious about her death, and it was never investigated by law enforcement. Sharon, who was wife number two, died at 52. In 1998, Bob retired from his job at the radio station and moved to Grand Junction in Colorado. His new neighbors described him as a great guy, friendly and outgoing. There, he discovered a passion for the theater and began acting. It turned out he was really good at it. Over the years, Bob told various stories to different people about how he lost his wives and children. He told one that Nancy had committed suicide after his daughter died of a heroin overdose and that his son was killed in a car accident. He told another that both his children had died in a car accident and he told another that one of his wives had died of cancer. In July 2000, Bob was preparing for his role in the musical Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat and was finding it difficult to memorize his lines and his eyesight was deteriorating. So he visited his doctor. A month later, he was diagnosed with terminal lung cancer. Judy Hilty met Bob and they shared a passion for renovating and refurbishing old houses. A couple months later, she became wife number four. When investigators learned of Bob's diagnosis, they decided to interview him to see if he was ready to clear his conscience and confess. Bob's terminal cancer rate issues about his competency and investigators wanted to ensure that they did everything right. So they contacted the Federal Bureau of Investigations, National Center for the Analysis of Violent Crime. They provided behavioral analysis and specialized interview techniques to encourage Bob to talk. On September 14th, investigators showed up at Bob's house, and he was ready to talk. He admitted to shooting Nancy, David, and Susan, and pushing Donna to her death. He told them, you've got your serial, as in serial killer. He insisted that he did not kill Sharon. He stated his reason for shooting his family is that he was tired of the family life. And his reason for Donna was simply that sending her off a cliff was easier than a divorce. ABC News reported that he showed no remorse, saying, I'm different. I think I am interesting. And that he agreed to confess because he wanted FBI profilers to explain to him why he was so good at killing. Finally, three weeks later, Bob was indicted and arrested at his home. He was charged with Donna's murder in the Grand Canyon. A few days later, he attended a hearing in Grand Junction, then immediately was extradited to Arizona and charged with three counts of first-degree murder for Nancy, David, and Susan. 67-year-old Bob was telling friends that he only had six months to live. The cancer had spread to his brain. His fourth wife, Judy, told the media that even after she learned about the murder charges, she didn't fear her new husband. Perhaps that's because he was behind bars. The Arapahoe County District Attorney's Office consulted with the relatives of his first wife and children, and they mutually agreed that it wasn't practical to prosecute him, as it was unlikely that he'd live to see the end of a trial. Bob pled guilty to Donner's murder and admitted to shooting his first family and entered into a plea agreement where he would spend the rest of his life in prison. Bob had the audacity to make a dying wish. He asked that his ashes be scattered in the Grand Canyon, the same canyon where he murdered Donna. Her family asked the court not to allow it, and a judge agreed with them. 
In August 2001, Bob died. And who knows where he's buried? But we do know he is not spending eternity in the Grand Canyon. Thanks for listening to Murder in 20 with less talk and more true crime. Be sure to tune in next Wednesday for the episode of Josh and Amber Hilberling. Barely out of their teens when they got married. Ten months later, she pushed him out of a window and his broken body landed 17 stories below. She was found guilty and his death haunted her until she committed suicide. If you're dying to hear more, past episodes of Murder in 20 are available for free at murderin20.com, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, and YouTube. And every week, we announce upcoming episodes on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Until then, stay safe, sleep with the lights on, and don't play with strangers.